Hey everybody, Joe Conkley in the shop. Today, in the shop, we have this uh, really interesting uh, Martin guitar. It is a D28, as you can see. It's got the Brazilian rosewood back and sides, the standard zigzag D28 back strip. Um, herringbone, ebony bridge and fingerboard, but you'll notice right off the bat, pick guard's on the wrong side. And why is that? Because it's a left-handed guitar. And um, when we saw this guitar come in, our first question was, really, is it a real left-handed Martin original from the factory, or was it changed? Um, there's no sign of a pick guard being on this side of the guitar ever. That was the first thing we looked at. Um, what looks like an original pick guard on this side. And of course, the next thing you do when you're trying to figure this out is you look at the head, the neck block. There's the neck, there's a block that that neck is set into. And that's where Martin puts their serial number and their model number. And that's a pretty definitive way to, to really see what's going on with, with the model of a Martin guitar. Let me put my light in here. And as you can see, or can you see? Is that better? Yeah, that's probably better. Uh, the model is a D28S.L. Serial number 78068. That serial number puts it as a 1941. And when I look how the, the model number is stamped, it looks pretty right, like all the other model stamps that we see from Martin. And our first thought was, really? A real left-handed pre-war, so it's 1941. Pre-war uh, is usually thought of as before 1942 and before. A real left-handed pre-war Martin guitar. And uh, it appears to be so. And uh, we were able to confirm that with Martin Guitars, that this was a special order. S for special, L for left-handed. So it's one of two that we know of from Martin Guitars. Two, uh, they, they only had on record two uh, you know, left-handed guitars uh, prior to uh, 1942. Um, let me, prep, let me uh, get a little more specific there. I don't, for sure, it's one of two left-handed dreadnoughts, pre-war dreadnoughts. There may be, I don't want to say something that isn't true, but anyhow, a, a unique guitar. Um, one of the other u super unique things about it is this peghead shape. And when we saw that, we said, oh my, that's not a Martin guitar. It doesn't have the official <clears throat> Martin peghead shape. But it sure looks like the peg head that has always been on this neck and the neck has always been on this guitar and they all look like Martin work from that period. The logo is the um, fine script with a black outline from that era from that era with the little crosshatch piece there on the F that is straight, which is what we'd expect, as opposed to the little swirly one, which is a little bit earlier. But it has several unique, unique things. A, the shape, which actually reminded me of some of the Martin mandolins of that era. So that, and, uh, and the tuners. Of course, it has had a severe peghead break, which has been fixed repaired, it's super solid, it's not very neat and clean, but it's very solid. It's been pinned. Two small dials going right in there. And two larger dials underneath there. Um, so we looked to Martin Guitars and also to the, uh, uh, the owners of the guitar to uh, give us as much information as we could to make sure we knew what what, uh, what we had, and they were able to provide us with a, just a bounty of provenance. Um, the uh, original owner of the guitar, who was ceased, 
his relatives brought it in. He, he had just a, a mound of, of uh, photos and uh, an audio tape um, all about his career as a musician, and this guitar was part of his career. The peghead, the thing about the peghead that was very interesting was that he had a friend who uh, had designed a fine-tuning uh, mechanism that fit on the peghead of a guitar. Um, this little plaque here, his part was uh, actually cut off of that fine-tuning mechanism. And he got Martin to, that was another part of the special of this guitar, he got Martin to make a custom peghead shape and install that fine tuner as it fit right here, um, fit here. And uh, um, so it was a one-of-a-kind thing that I think he was hoping to turn into a, maybe his own little gold mine possibly and uh, produce them again, but we had never seen one before. We did have some photos in his provenance to, uh, to show us this, but that's what it was. Special peg head shape to accommodate that fine tuning mechanism thing. So, and when the peg head broke, the fine special tuners. Special tuners, that's right. Tuners that would go along with the peg head mechanism. They had like an elliptical where the, it looked like the screws. My right hand man, Steve Olson, chiming in here and keeping my information correct. Well, it looked like the screws, like they had tabs that came off the top of the post with maybe a locking screw or something, I don't know, like kind of, they were sort of like, a, and then the, they were just like guides, like little mushrooms on that plate that steered the springs like, you know, for, for like a low friction fine tuning. Really interesting idea well before its time, stuff that has been pursued later on by lots of other people. Yeah. But, so <laughs> our best guess was the peg head broke, the fine tuning system came off, a more normal sort of uh, uh, Grover, Grover open back tuners, but from a later period, not from 1941, more like a 50s style tuner here, with the square buttons were put on. Um, and uh, so, so there's that. And then they cut off this little part of the uh, fine tuning mechanism, which had, um, oddly enough, the gentleman's nickname was Lefty. And that's the uh, radio station, WBAL, that he was uh, playing at at the time. But it also had August 1941 in there, which is when the guitar was originally made. So uh, a pretty unique guitar. Um, Well-worn. The, the gentleman lefty was a, a regional music star in, the, in the, really one of the heydays of country music there in the 40s on through the 50s. Um, and uh, in various places um, um, from the Midwest to the East Coast and um, yeah, played with, at, like I said, a regional star on the radio and in person, a lot, of in per um, a lot of gigs traveling all over the place and rubbed elbows with a lot of big country music stars, um, which is all very interesting and part of that provenance. So this guitar will be on consignment at Eldrill Instruments very soon, as soon as I get the repairs done. And uh, the repairs completed, and uh, that whole story will be part of the consignment and a lot more information on that coming out. So um, let's take a look at the actual repairs I did here and what I needed, and what I needed to do. The first thing that I needed to do was to take this bridge um, which was screwed on and repaired and cracked right here and shaved down quite low. It was loose and coming off, a very low saddle. Um, for a, any number of reasons, we decided to replace the bridge. It had also shifted, um, it had come loose and shifted. You can see this line right here in the, on the finish that, uh, where the bridge had set like that. So it had changed position, the intonation was off. Removed the bridge, did some very minor touch-up around that, not to make any of these marks disappear completely, but to bring that look sort of together with the rest of the guitar, you know, so that I could put this original footprint bridge on there. So I've got this original footprint and shape bridge uh, I still have to cut that left-handed saddle slot in there. I'm going to cut
cut a long style left-handed saddle slot. Um, inside the guitar, there were numerous problems with, or not problems, but um, changes done to the bridge, like a bunch of holes. A lot of wear from the, from the ball ends and a number of extra holes, two of which accommodated those two screws there. And this um, crack right here in the top, and this top crack. So, but given all the things that were going on with the guitar, that was all I had to do. So let's see, Juan and I are trying to, my producer and cameraman and all around everything guy here in the shop, we were trying to see if we could give you guys a look at the interior of the guitar so we can see what's going on with that uh, with the bridge plate. So I, um, the bridge plate itself was still solid, glued on well, and um, doing its job as far as adding to the structure of the instrument. And so I decided to leave that original bridge plate in there and do what I could to um, repair any of our concerns here. Let's see if we can see that now. There. So I used the uh, Stumac Bridge Saver tool to create um, patches and matching holes to cover the, uh, here, maybe I can do this. If we look inside, you can see there, you know, so there are, no, that's not working, but two holes where the screws were, a third screw hole in the back there, and all of the uh, um, string holes had wear and tear on the bridge plate. So there are six, seven, eight, nine patches going on there on the bridge plate. And in addition, if you look um, at the uh, finger brace that is right here on both sides, you can see a, a, an additional hole that went part in the side of the uh, of the X brace there, not straight down through the middle, but in the side of it, I've patched those also. Not quite finished with the look of the interior there. I still have to do some sanding and cleaning up to make that look better. But again, I was able to do all those repairs there and save that original bridge plate. You can see a cleat here that I put on the pick guard crack and some other cleats back here. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, we can see those other cleats back there. So the interior has to be cleaned up a little bit in and around my repair work yet still. But that is the interior work on the repair. So, in a so I took, the took this bridge off, did all the interior work, the touch up around the top, put the new bridge on, and um, also removed the neck and reset the neck. You can also let me take the mirror out here. You can see that I've got the, the frets removed at this point in the process. The next step that I'm going to do is to um, uh, refret the guitar, clean and true up the uh, fretboard, and put some new frets in. And I'll have to uh, cut that slot for the saddle. And I'll be able to string it up at that point. Um, there are a couple other areas of damage on the guitar that um, we were discussing with the owners about whether they wanted to spend the money to do these fixes. And one is this damage to the sound hole here. You can see that there's a fair amount of wear and tear on the sound hole. It's where he was strumming from there to there, pretty much. And so much wear and tear, like this part right here, that this little part piece was just missing, fell off there. So I am going to replace that piece. He had another a reason there is this wear and tear here is from a DeArmond pickup, electric, electric pickup that was in there. It, it is a, uh, you know, a magnetic sound hole pickup that attaches to the edge of the hole right there. And they had it uh, coming out through this jack hole there, which you can see at one point the jack or the strap got caught and created some, some um, cracks. These cracks were previously repaired. This is the, 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 the condition we received the guitar and there is a interior, fairly large but thin interior reinforcement around that hole now. Um, we're, still we're still trying to decide, 
with the owner whether we're going to patch that hole or not. Um, yeah, a lot of other repairs and uh, fairly extensive and expensive repairs, but uh, that still remains to be seen yet. But um, that's pretty much the repairs I'm gonna uh, I need to do so far. So I'm anticipating that over the next few weeks here I'll be able to complete these repairs and get this baby up for sale and uh, more of that provenance and story will um, um, come out as we get this guitar fixed up. The back. We want to see the back of the guitar. All right. That's Juan and I using hand signals to communicate and me not understanding. But yeah, beautiful, um, tight grained, um, you know, chocolatey dark stripes on the Brazilian rosewood. But you can see here's an area of major wear and tear. Uh, lefty probably had a fairly big belt buckle and uh, created a lot of wear on the back, but no cracks. Same with the sides. Um, actually, the sides are in pretty good shape. Some wear. Right here, there's like a lot of sweat wear here. You can see that this whole corner got sweated on a lot, probably. Created a lot of finish missing right there, and right here are worn through. But the only crack on the sides are these right here uh, surrounding the, uh, the, uh, the hole for the electric guitar jack or the electric pickup jack. And there we go. 19, a pre-war left-handed D28. We'll be on consignment here at Elderly Instruments. Look for it in the next month. And uh, great story that goes along with it. Thanks for tuning in to In the Shop. Remember to share us and like us on Facebook. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks.